on the potter's house. There's very little that shows a relationship between God and us. The way that that relationship is portrayed at the potter's house. Jeremiah was told to go and look and watch and that God would give the message there. And what a poignant message it was. Something that you and I need to keep in mind is that Jesus didn't just come to earth and die to save us from our sins. Yes, he did that. I came to seek and to save those that were lost. But he also came that we might be his representatives, that we could be that usable piece of pottery, that, that uh, piece that would bring honor and glory to him. And that's a part of what we are to do. And that's what was being shown to uh, Jeremiah, God in image form, was wonderfully teaching valuable lessons to Israel, but to us also. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I'll give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, and he said, Can I not do with you, Israel? As this potter does, like clay in the hands of the potter, so are you in my hands, Israel. That has not changed. You and I still serve the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Master of Masters. And not only is he your king, he is your master. He is the master potter. And he's forming our lives. You see, the potter had a mission. And we looked at that last week. The mission was very clear to Jeremiah. When he got down to the potter's house in verse 1 through 3. God said, I'll give you my message. And there it was. In, in living color, I saw him working at the wheel. You see, the potter's intention, what he had in his mind, what he had in his heart, that precise purpose that he had was to take clay and from that clay produce a vessel that would be profitable, that would be useful, but that would also bring honor to him. That's God's intention for me and you. Every day, God is molding us into his plan, what he's already seen for me and you. Every day, God is interested in in taking the worst and molding it and making it the best that heaven has to offer. Something that will benefit the kingdom of God. Something that will bring glory and honor to him. The potter used clay dug from the ground. As it comes from the ground... It's not very usable. 
There's a process that it has to go through. You and I are often in that process, and it's not a pleasant process because we have to be made malleable, moldable in the hands of the potter. Lumps have to be removed. Debris has to be taken out. Taken out. So there's nothing left but clay that is pure that can go in the furnace and come out as some beautiful vessel, not cracked and marred and lumpy and di disfigured. God's desire is to make us into that which is absolutely beautiful, and sometimes it hurts us. A very good friend of mine years ago used to have a little part in a song that she would sing. And it was from the clay's standpoint and how the clay was so proud because the potter was starting to mold him and make him into something useful and he had just laid there in the ground all this time and everything was wasting away and the rains would come and the cold would come and how that, that clay felt so useless. And as the potter's fingers begin to dig in and, and, and mold him, it was hurting and he would cry out, oh, that hurts, don't do that. And then there was lumps and debris, impurities that were found in the clay. And the potter would have to dig it out and lay it to the side. And it would make holes in, in that ball of clay. And the clay would flinch and cry out, it hurts, it hurts. What a perfect picture of what God is doing in us. And sometimes it hurts. You see, there's instruments that the potter uses that helps him. He used shovels to dig it out. And sometimes God has to use the Holy Spirit. And he puts pressure and leverage on us. To bring us out of that old life and bring us into the new life. But once we get into that new life, like when the potter finally gets the clay out of the ground, then the potter takes a mallet and starts beating on it. And that's very unpleasant. Then you're thrown on the wheel. And some of you this morning are on the wheel. And that's a difficult place to be because you're spinning around, you're being formed. All kind of pressures are coming into play and you're being pressed from every side and it hurts. So many have sat across the desk from me and say, why? Why is God doing this? And the only thing I can say is he's totally in control and he's not doing it to harm. He's not doing it to hurt. He's doing it to make you better. To make you usable. To bring you to a place where he can rely upon you. The potter's hands are always on that hunk of clay. He never takes his hands off. Because if he did, then the clay would fly off the wheel. But he makes sure that his hands are always on that clay, molding and making. God is totally in control, regardless of what you're facing in life. Nothing happens to that clay that the potter does not know about. 
the water that's added to it, the pressure that's placed upon it. Everything is known by the potter's hands. He's in constant contact. Jesus said, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. But I'll be with you always, even unto the end of this age. Oh, I know there's times when God seems so remote, millions of miles away. But he's always right there. Never far from us or our needs. And God has promised, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So that brings us to the place where we left off last week. The potter had a ministry. In Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 4, it says, But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seems best to him. The problem was in the vessel. It always is. Even in the potter's hands, there's things that can go so terribly wrong. No, the fault is not with the potter, but with the clay. There are times when even the best care and the vessel gets out of shape. And it doesn't give. And there's impurities inside. It's the way our lives are. Remember, we're made from clay. And everything's going along just fine. And then suddenly, there's a temptation or a trial. For one reason or another... You and I are thrown off balance. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you, but it's happened to me many times. Too many. We become marred in the potter's hands. Those temptations arise. Those pressures are brought upon us. Those trials present themselves. Every turn of the wheel, as we're sitting upon that wheel, every turn makes that blemish more visible. Every day that we live, every day that we go through, that blemish, that marred place becomes more and more visible. And it becomes evident that God will never be able to use us in our present state. Never be guilty of believing that this cannot happen to you. Because the moment you think you're standing, you better be careful. There are people who started out running well for the Lord... But along the way, they got weak. They got out of balance. Things worked their way to the surface that they didn't even know was there. And it wasn't long before they were a vessel of dishonor. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12 says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. The Bible says, is strewn with wreckage of lives that began so good and ended so poor. You have Alexander in 1 Timothy chapter 1. But the one that grips my heart is Demas. And Paul writes that plaintive plea. Demas has forsaken us, having loved this present world. I've seen it happen so many times. It breaks my heart every time. I can just imagine 
Demas sitting at the trial of Paul, seeing everything that was happening, must have gripped his heart. Along the road to success, you find the wreckage of many tra tragedies. There's a perception of the potter because his hands are resting on that vessel. The potter knows instantly when a problem arises. He senses the change in the clay and he begins to take whatever steps are necessary to correct that problem. You know, we think that we're so good that we can hide something from God. God's hands are ever upon us. And when we start getting out of shape, when something arises in us, he detects it the minute that change begins. There are times when all of us are nothing more than cracked pots. Even though God's hands are upon us, even though his hands rest upon us, but he knows that crack is there. He knows instantly and he's aware. And he knows what it's going to take to patch it up. At that moment, those necessary steps will get us back into usable condition. If you and I can stand the, the, the pain and the pressure of the mold. Never think for even one second that you can hide anything from God. He sees it all. He's aware of every thought. He's aware of every deed. He's aware of every motive. And he allows none of it. To get past those knowing fingers or that glazing eye. If God knows every need that I have, then surely he knows every sin that I've committed. He knows of every flaw that I have in my character that needs correction and he can take care of it. I'm kidding myself if I think I can hide it. Can't be done. The best thing that you and I can do is become responsive in his touch. And when he puts his finger on something that's not very nice about us. That flaw that's there, that, that crack that's presented itself, whatever it may be, the moment his fingers begin to touch it, we should give with it, not fight against it. And allow God to just mold us into what he knows that we can be so that he can begin to use us for his honor and his glory so that he can display us. Potter's got to have great, great patience. That patience of the potter. Even when the clay is misshapen, when it's deformed, it's still in his hand, and he hadn't given up. The potter makes the marred vessel, and he presses it back into a lump, and he'll begin again if he has to. <coughs> but this time, that vessel will probably turn out well, because he's going to take care of the problem. But there's a chance it could deform again. 
there's a chance it could crack again. Listen to me now. As long as the clay is moldable, God will continue to work on it. As long as the clay stays soft in his hands, God in that long-suffering, ever-abiding patience will continue to make us into what he sees that we can be. Might mean he has to dig into our lives. It means that possibly that he has to change something. That process is not pleasant. But as long as we stay soft in his hands, he'll make us into something that he can use. There's times when the Lord has to bring chastisement into our lives. It, it's so now. It would be so then. He does this because he loves us. He cares for us. And he wants to see us be the very best that we can be. He wants to see us excel. It, it, it. It doesn't make it hurt any less. But we know that it's really for our good. Revelation 3.19 says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. That means quickly become soft and vi uh, pliable in his hands. When that vessel is marred, the potter doesn't throw it away. No. He starts fresh. Starts over again. He adds the water of the word and the, and the spirit. And he begins to mold again and make us into what he wants. It may be a different picture this time. But there's a reason for this. God's already invested too much in salvaging you and I. Bringing us out of the clay or out, out of the dirt. Paying the price. He has an investment in me and you. And he wants to see us succeed. He can afford to be patient. And he'll keep working on the clay until it begins to resemble that which he desires or until it becomes so hard that he can't. The potter, especially the heavenly potter, never throws his clay away. Jesus paid that ultimate price. That sacrifice, when we were still in sin and disuse, now he desires us to become something profitable. What God saves, God keeps. John 6, 37 says, All those the Father has given me, come unto me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast them away. But remember, there are those times. There is that point. There's that place. That the clay becomes no longer pliable to the potter's touch. When this happens, the potter has no choice but to set aside that hardened vessel. And he chooses another lump of clay that he can work with his hands. Many times, God has to place people on a shelf that have become hard and resistant. 
God removes his hands at that point because there's no need to go any further. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, I discipline my body, Paul says, and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So you and I need to discipline our lives so that we remain pliable, soft in the potter's hands. And I close. The potter has a message. And I don't want you to miss this message. In verses 5 and 6 of Jeremiah 18, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, and he says this, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter is done, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hands of the potter, so are you in my hands, O Israel. There's a message here about control over what the clay becomes, what happens to the clay. The potter has total control over that clay. Whatever gets added, whatever gets taken away, whatever happens to that clay that potter has control over it in his hands. He makes it what he desires. What a great message for the people of God, especially under the circumstances that you and I are living under right now. We have to remember that God is in control 24 hours a day. God never takes his hands off from us. He makes us into what he wishes and that which happens around us and to us, he's very well aware of it. Some turn out to be sturdy vessels. And they're used over and over and over again. And they can be used for so many different things. But there's others that turn out to be very fine quality, delicate, like an expensive china. And it's only used on special occasions. Those occasions arrive, arise. And they're always, whether it's that vessel that's used over and over and that's sturdy and hardy, or whether it's that super fine, beautiful little vase. It's always for the glory of God. It's always on those special occasions. Others might be used in ways that's not quite as honorable. But they can still be used of God. Whatever the usage, it's according to what that master potter has in his mind. It's the choice that he has to make. The clay has no rights to question the potter's judgment in matter of what kind of vessel it becomes. In Isaiah chapter 45 verse 9, this poignant, very poignant, Scripture. What sorrows await those who argue with their Creator? Does the clay pot argue with its Maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, Stop, you're doing it wrong? Does the pot exclaim, How clumsy can you be with me? But yet, many of us are guilty of doing that.
to God. The whole point here is that God is making the decisions and He decides what He wants to do with you and me. My duty and your duty is to submit. You see, this message is about compliance. The only duty that the clay has is to yield to the hands of the potter. I want the blessing uh, that God's got for me. And the only way that I can receive that is to be used by Him in whatever way He sees fit. So all I'm saying here is grow beautiful where you're planted. Wherever God puts you, be useful there because He knows the beginning from the end. You and I do not. So can you honestly say today that you're totally yielded to God. You've given everything to His will for your life. There's not one area that you've reserved for yourself. Would you have to say, well, there's a few areas where I'm still in control. There's part of my life that I really don't want to give up. There's circumstances that I face that I still think I can handle. Are you lumpy before God? Or are you putty in the pastor's hand, uh, master potter's hand? Many years ago, in the horse and buggy days, a man and his wife were driving along in a buckboard, pulled by a couple of horses. They were on a very dangerous stretch of the road. And the woman kept looking over the side, and the wheels were right on the edge of a precipice that fell many hundreds of feet. And she got extremely nervous. And in this nervous, frightful state, she reaches over and grabs one of the reins of the horse. And as calmly as possible, the husband responds by taking the other rein and handing it over to the wife and says, here, you want this? And she said, no, 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 no. I don't want them both. I could never manage these animals alone. Then the husband very gently said, well then, you must make your choice. It's either going to be you or me. We both can't drive the same horse. That frightened heart very quickly surrendered that full control back over to her husband. And everything once again was good in his hands. And they continued on their journey. Many of us are kind of like that. We want to just let me use one rain, God. Just, just one. I don't want them both. I just want one. Or we're kind of like the man who uh, rode in his car while he was being towed. And there was a very steep hill that he had to be towed up under to the repair shop. And he, he was going up that hill. And the truck driver, when they finally got there, he said, you know, I didn't think I was going to make it up that hill. And 
The man who was in the car said, I didn't either. That's why I kept the brakes on so that we wouldn't roll backwards. Some of us, God is pulling forward, but we're riding with the brakes on because we want to stay a little bit in control. So this morning, as you're flying around on the spinning wheel of life, are you confident that God's will is being done in your life as it should be? Can you sense that the heavenly potter has his hands on you and that he's patiently and lovingly making you into his image so that when people look at you, they see Jesus in you. If you're a vessel that's refusing to yield, if you're a vessel that's resisting, no better time than right now to surrender and say, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I'll cling. God, I'm coming home. I'm giving you everything. Whatever you want to do, put your hands on me and make me into what's pleasing to you. No better time than right now will you allow him to work in your life. Let him save your vessel so that it brings honor and glory to the kingdom of God. If you've never surrendered, today's the day. If you've never given everything to God, that God who loves you, today's the day. If you surrendered many years ago, but over the years you've just grown a little hard and cold and distant, would you let his hands be upon you again? Let him work with you. Let him use you for that place of usefulness and profitableness and beauty that you were created for. Today's the day. Would you bow your heads with me, please?